This is one of the reasons that I wrote the book, was to try to show people, open up their eyes to all of these, these issues that are facing us uh, that potentially threaten our entire future. And also to see how, how bright our future could be if we can make it through this time. It was kind of my being so inspired by, by what humanity could do and its, its potential uh, that, that made me you know, fight more fiercely to try to protect that potential. And so uh, I wrote this to try to let everyone really see that. Uh, previously, discussions about this have been a bit dry and academic and, uh, and harder for, for people to actually understand all of these issues. So I wanted people to be able to see it and to start these conversations, uh, both personal level and then also as kind of like larger conversations in society. That is Toby Ord, philosopher and senior research fellow at Oxford's Future of Humanity Institute. He's also the author of a new book called The Precipice, Existential Risk and the Future of Humanity. Although the title of his book sounds scary, it's actually a fascinating read and explores a lot of the topics that we are probably thinking about right now. In our conversation, we explore how Toby goes about determining what the future risks for humanity will be. We look at some of the most immediate risks we face, Toby's view of the future of AI and automation, how we can think about the big picture without getting overwhelmed, and much more. The way I see it is that there have been risks that have faced humanity over hundreds of thousands of years, these natural risks. But it was only with nuclear weapons in the 20th century that we reached a point where humanity's escalating power over the natural world was so great uh, that it could threaten our entire continued existence. And yet our wisdom and ability to actually behave responsibly had grown only falteringly, if at all. And so it put us into this precarious position uh, where we still are, uh, which I call the precipice, hence the name of the book. And this is a time where we are we you know suffer these these existential risks. And I think that this time can only go on for a few centuries, either because we just if the risks stay at the current levels or increase, continue to increase, then I think we couldn't survive more than a few more centuries of this. But I also think it's possible that we'll survive it because we'll actually get our act together and we'll lower these risks and get them down to more sensible levels. That we you know we'll, we'll grow up about this this issue. Welcome to the Future of Work with Jacob Morgan, where every week I speak with the world's top business leaders, executives, and authors. From leadership to employee experience to the future of work, this is where you will get the insights, the tools, and the inspiration you need to succeed and thrive at work and in life. If you want to future-proof your career and your organization, then this is the show for you. My brand new book, The Future Leader, which is based on interviews with 140 CEOs around the world, explores the top skills and mindsets for future leaders, and it's out now. You can grab a copy at getfutureleaderbook.com. If you want to get in touch with me about sponsoring the show or having me keynote your next event, you can visit thefutureorganization.com or email me directly, jacob at thefutureorganization.com. Lastly, If you get a few seconds, please rate the podcast on Apple Podcasts or whatever your preferred platform is. It really helps spread the word about the show, and I personally appreciate it. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Future of Work with Jacob Morgan. My guest today is Toby Ord. He's a philosopher and senior research fellow at Oxford's Future of Humanity Institute, and he has a brand new book out called The Precipice, Existential Risk and the Future of Humanity. So, Toby, thank you for joining me. Oh, great to be here. So, I got to admit, when I looked at the book and read the book, I got a little freaked out because the title itself is scary. Um, And then, so, as I started to go through the book and read a lot of the content, I mean, you made some very interesting arguments and points there that I think a lot of people are thinking about now, but maybe we just don't talk about as much. Um, But before we jump into some of those things, why don't we start with just high level. As a philosopher and as a research fellow at the Future of Humanity Institute, what do you spend a lot of your time studying and thinking about these days? Yeah, I've I've generally focused on uh, big picture questions facing humanity. Uh, So that's not what uh, people who study ethics in philosophy are normally doing. Normally, the, the question is, 
looking at the the questions of everyday life of what should I do? Uh, so studying the ethics of when is it okay to kill? Um, is it okay to kill if you're a soldier during a war? Uh, or, you know, when is it okay to lie? Things like that. Uh, but I'm interested in these questions on a much larger scale. And so earlier on in my career, I spent a lot of time looking at the ethics of global poverty. So this is a huge issue facing billions of people in the world. And what are the obligations that we in the rich countries have to do something about that? And how can we best help? Uh, so that's what I was looking at uh, when I started my career. And I've also been interested in this, this uh, other theme, uh, which is where the book comes in, looking at this kind of grander questions about the history of humanity and the future of humanity. And are there any risks uh, that could threaten uh, our entire future? Uh, so that, that's what I'm, uh, I've spent a lot of the last 10 years uh, asking and thinking about. How do you even begin to understand that? I mean, the the history aspect makes sense, right? I mean, we have documents, we have records, we have data, we have lots of things we can look at for the past. But when you think about the future and some of these existential risks, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes, mm -hmm. how do you even go about thinking about that, determining if they're actually risks? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. <laughs> um, I mean, I should say with, with the with the past, uh, we have written records dating back about 5,000 years. Uh, but humanity, uh, if you take it to be Homo sapiens, uh, goes back 200,000 years. And that's sometimes fascinating in and of itself uh, to think that for almost all the time that people have existed and for lots of the greatest things that humans have ever done, uh, you know, a lot of fierce fr friendships and uh, strong loves that people have had for each other, you know, fighting against adversity. A lot of the adventures that people have had, finding all of the plants and kind of understanding the animals and ecosystems and, you know, first person to see the tiger or the rhinoceros or the first person to enter Australia, this whole new continent of different animals, that a huge amount of that happened before we even had uh, the ability to write down and, and understand it. So thinking about that, about the past, has really opened my eye to, to just how epic this span of, of human history has been. And then that helps in thinking about the future as well to, to think, you know, about the next 10 years or the next 20 years, which is what a lot of people think about when they're thinking about the future, but also about the next 200,000 years um, or millions of years. How long could humanity last? Uh, so that's something I'm very interested in and have looked into a lot of the, the astrophysics of, of questions about the, the Earth's uh, lifespan and things like that. Um, and when it comes to to particularly the risks that we might face over the next hundred years, uh, yeah, I've had to read a lot uh, about uh, science and technology, and uh, and really talk to a lot of experts. Uh, that's been a real focus with the book. Uh, it it looks at a lot of issues uh, in cutting edge science, and I really this is a real area where it's easy to to screw it up when you're writing a book like this. If you have a great idea about uh, something closer to your own discipline. Um, but then you have to say a lot of things about other disciplines for it to make sense. It's easy to just, uh, you know, kind of make it up. Uh, so I wanted to really make sure I didn't do that and uh, talk to uh, really the cutting edge experts in all of these different risks. And I uh, also have them look over the book before it went to print to make sure that I hadn't made any errors and that I was faithfully uh, conveying the, the cutting edge information about these things. How or what sort of a timeline um, and right after this, we'll jump into what some of those risks are. <laughs> but what sort of a timeline were you looking at for these things? Or were, was it spread all over the map? You know, some very far out, some closer. You mean uh, when would the, uh, would the risks strike? Yes. Yeah. So I generally set myself uh, the next century as the, uh, as the time span uh, with a lot of risks, such as the risk of asteroids. Um, and in, in general, with the natural risks, uh, these are things that basically could strike us at any time. Uh, and the, the chance it happens in 100 years is basically 100 times the chance that it happens in one year. Uh, so it doesn't really matter what time frame you look at things like that over. Uh, when it comes to risks from emerging technologies, then it really can matter. Uh, if I said the next decade, uh, then some of these things, such as the risks from advanced artificial intelligence, probably wouldn't really register because they're unlikely to happen in that time frame. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to pick something that was, you know, long enough and, and felt good uh, to, to really uh, get your teeth into. And I, I thought 100 years worked pretty well. Okay. 
Uh, well, let's jump into what some of those risks are. And I think some of the risks uh, people will very much be able to relate to, for example, some of the technology risks, uh, climate change that you talk about in the book is something everybody is concerned. Well, mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of people are concerned with. Um, so maybe you can outline what are some of the risks that you talk about in the book? Sure. Uh, so I, I divide them into the in the book uh, into the the natural risks first. Uh, so things like asteroids, comets, uh, the, the supernovae. So stars exploding uh, is another possibility. Super volcanoes. Um, so these uh, these massive eruptions of volcanoes that are so big, like uh, like the uh, the one in Yellowstone National Park, uh, where instead of towering above the ground, they're kind of these sunken craters because they're, they're they're too massive to actually be able to stand up, uh, and uh, that there is indeed some risk from them. Uh, and these are the, these are the natural risks. Uh, then I also look at uh, the risks, the anthropogenic risks of today, uh, and my focus there is on uh, nuclear war, on climate change, and of all kinds of other environmental catastrophes, ways in which by destroying some crucial part of the environment, uh, that might be the end for us. And then I look at uh, these anthropogenic risks that aren't quite here yet, but are on the horizon. Uh, and my focus there is on engineered pandemics and also uh, unaligned artificial intelligence. So quite a few things going on out there. Um, so mm -hmm. it sounds like there's a lot of stuff that could potentially wipe us off, <laughs> wipe us off the map. Um, and so for a lot of people listening to this, they might be thinking, "All right, why should I care? You know, why? You know, I can't control a comet coming over here or a volcano or anything like that." So for people listening to this who maybe have that mentality in their mind, how how can we make this a little bit real for them? Like, why why should we all care about these things? Yeah. So. I, I can see people uh, not being that concerned about the asteroids, say, and I think that you know maybe they're right about that in some ways because when you know when we look at the current levels of risk as we best understand the problem at the moment, uh, I think that there's about a one in a million chance of us being wiped out by an asteroid in the next hundred years. Uh, so that is a small chance, and it's a at least in terms of your own life. Um, you know, is we often neglect chances that are smaller than one in a million. Um, you know, maybe maybe they're right about that. I think that if they read a newspaper report which said that there's an asteroid which is on an almost direct course to hit the Earth, and that's definitely going to come in, you know, much closer than the orbit of the Moon, and there's a one in ten chance that it's going to hit the Earth, I think that they would be really caring about that. Um, and that this would be, they, they wouldn't just kind of turn the page in the newspaper and uh, kind of carry on about their, their day. Uh, you know, this would be the, the biggest issue facing humanity. Uh, so I think that it, it does partly come down to, you know, the amount of probability of these things. Uh, something like an asteroid has this nice feature that we can understand it scientifically quite clearly. Uh, and we can get these fairly robust numbers out of it. Whereas with other things, such as the risk of an engineered pandemic, uh, uh, either making humanity go extinct or causing the uh, the permanent collapse of civilization. We, you know, sometimes we we read some stories about how bad these things could get, and we feel very alarmed. But it's hard to put precise numbers on it, and so I think that's one of the reasons uh, that that people, uh, I guess, either panic a lot or sh shrug it off is that it's hard to just have some kind of mid level number that goes. To from the risks that you talk about in the book, which ones do you think are the most, I don't want to say real, but most immediate or closest in terms of time horizon? In terms of, yeah, time horizon, I would say, uh, I would say nuclear war um, is, uh, is uh, something that could happen soon. Although, luckily, you know, the Cold War is over um, and... It's not just any nuclear war that could cause a threat uh, of human extinction. It's only uh, the, the largest scales of nuclear war that would really pose such a threat. And even then, we would probably get through. It would be, it would be devastating, but we probably would make it through. Um, so maybe it would require uh, another Cold War starting up uh, with, uh, with Russia or perhaps with China if they increased their nuclear arsenal in such a war. Um, so I guess that it's hard for that to happen in, say, the next 10 years. Um, with climate change, 
uh, you know, I should say by the end of the century, though, anything could happen. You know, uh, it's, it's not actually all that long since the end of the Cold War and the century is a long time. Uh, so the, the political situation could get very different uh, with climate change. Uh, it's actually quite hard to say whether climate change poses a real risk of uh, human extinction or the permanent collapse of civilization, which are the types of levels that I think about in the in the book. Uh, so, and if it did, it wouldn't happen in the next hundred years. But perhaps the next hundred years would be a time where you know we pass the point of no return or something like that. Uh, so it could still be you know very critical on that level of time frame. And then, I mean, within the next hundred years, I guess, uh, you know, within the next, after a, a couple of decades, I think that the, the risks from these engineered pandemics and artificial intelligence get quite high too. So I guess it's a, a bit of a mix there. Yeah. Well, let's talk about one that I'm sure a lot of people hear about. Uh, well, I suppose there are two main ones that a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, one is climate change and the second one is artificial intelligence. Maybe we could just quickly touch on climate change because I mm -hmm. know that a lot of businesses and organizations around the world are are very much talking about this and it's becoming a very central issue to the point where a lot of employees around the world actually want to be a part of organizations who are taking a stance on this and who are helping the environment, mm -hmm. helping the world. So what are you seeing in terms of the the climate change discussions, the, the the risks, how would you say that we are currently doing as far as that goes? Oh, uh, in terms of the discussions of the risk, I would say um, not well at all. Um, it's, I, I, I don't think that any, any normal person who doesn't spend, you know, their whole time thinking about this uh, could be forgiven for having, uh, you know, any opinion ranging from we're almost certain to, uh, to go extinct through to that's completely impossible based on what they read, because you see all kinds of uh, articles making all kinds of claims. And uh, there's not many people really holding them to account and making sure that they uh, they don't go far beyond what the science suggests. Uh, so uh, when I was writing this section on climate change, I expected to be able to conclude uh, that it doesn't pose an existential risk. So uh, one of these risks of extinction or permanent collapse of civilization. But I found that uh, as I went through the literature, it was it was harder to be sure than I'd thought. Um, so I'd thought originally that we could rule out uh, extreme warming, such as uh, the kind of Venus-like runaway greenhouse effect, where it gets 50 degrees or 100 degrees hotter than it is today and the oceans boil off. I thought we could just completely rule that out. But it turns out that while there are good papers that suggest it's not possible, you know, it, good papers suggesting something is is not actually, the, you know, 99.9% .9 certainty that it can't happen. There's plenty of papers that get overturned. It's not settled science. And I was, I was quite surprised by that. It's still very unlikely to happen, but it's hard to say how unlikely. Uh, and then when it comes to, uh, I thought that the, the history, um, so-called paleoclimate data, just the fact that it's been hotter in the past uh, than it's going to get now. Uh, surely that should show us that the earth can recover from getting this hot. But it turns out that that data is uh, is not that robust. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, if in the future people say, oh, we got that wrong using our methods and new methods say that it was a, the temperatures in the past were a bit different. And there were many things that were very different about the world back then, such as uh, there was a supercontinent and that could change uh, how that temperature affects uh, things. And then uh, perhaps more importantly than all of that, the the rate of change, uh, the the amount of degrees of warming per year, uh, looks like that may actually be unprecedented in the whole of the Earth's history, um, and in which case you can't draw many conclusions. Uh, so in the end, while I uh, while I wanted to be able to rule it out and and couldn't, uh, th the main risks are really it, it, it's not that we know of a particular effect of climate change that could definitely pose this existential threat, but rather that we're not yet at a position where we can completely rule it out. Uh, so I, I put this at something like one in a thousand chance. Okay. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about uh, everyone's favorite topic, and that is AI and technology, because we keep hearing that debate nonstop. Uh, you know, the movies keep coming out there like Terminator. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's everywhere. It's become part of part of culture these days. And I suppose the the number one concern that a lot of people have first is the impact that it'll have on jobs or the economy or on what we're going to be doing as individuals. And then maybe one level up from that is what happens if slash when AI becomes 
you know, human intelligence or surpasses us. Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe we can start with the first one. Have you thought about the impact or have you been studying the impact of technology on on jobs and just what we're going to be doing in the economy? So that's that hasn't been a central focus of my work, but I have been following the debate on this uh, where, you know, one side, you know, roughly speaking, one side thinks that we've had lots of technological change in the past. We've automated all kinds of jobs. Uh, it used to be that that most people did jobs in agriculture and now something like 99% of those jobs have been automated. And, uh, you know, only only a couple of percent of people uh, work in agriculture. Um, and so we can kind of survive uh, almost all the jobs we used to do being automated, uh, at least so long as it happens slowly enough. That, that, that's one, one kind of angle on that, where they say the unemployment rate in 2020 is not that different from the unemployment rate in 1820 or 1220 or something. Uh, it turns out that most people have jobs in all centuries. That's just one approach. And the other approach is uh, the analogy uh, with something like horses, where it used to be that there were jobs for a lot of horses uh, in the world. Um, and uh, then if you look at a, a chart of uh, how many horses there were in the US over time, uh, you see that it, it radically comes down as horses just become an, you know something that people have uh, for leisure rather than uh, at doing useful jobs of uh, taking people places, taking the mail places and so on, working in agriculture. Uh, and so the kind of question is, will it be like it's been in the past for, for humans or will it be like horses where ultimately there may be a few kind of oddball jobs for humans left, but almost everything's gone and almost, and there are you know hardly any jobs for humans. And I think it's very difficult to know which of those will be true. And so the way I see it, is that we can't really rule out, we can't be more than 90% confident in either of those views, I think, in this case. Um, which means that we're face, facing really at least a 10% chance uh, in terms of how you think about it, uh, that we're in the world where uh, all the jobs get automated and that it radically changes how work works. Um, I, I just think that you know we have to have a reasonable uh, belief that that could happen. And therefore, e even a 10% chance of that is is a huge thing that everyone has to plan around. Uh, so I think, you know, you can't really avoid that. Yeah. So, I mean, a chance is a chance. It, yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, there's all this kind of, I don't know what the, I don't know what people are hoping to do in, in academic debates. You know, you hope to show that your side's right. Uh, but a, a policymaker who's listening to to two academics, say two economists talking about this topic you know, they, they shouldn't end up thinking, you know, one one side's 100% right, and they're definitely going to happen. If, if it isn't totally, well, one side is saying that this is an unprecedented change uh, to automation, uh, because we've, we've previously automated the physical work, uh, making people increasingly move towards the, the work that requires a large amount of cognitive ability, whether that be dexterous hands, or whether that be, uh, you know, uh, knowledge work. Uh, and that if we then automate that stuff, uh, there's nothing left. So they're saying this is unprecedented and they seem to have a pretty good case. And it's just very hard to then, you know, rule that out, like to get more than, yeah, as I said, more than 90% confident that it's not true. And then you've really got to take that seriously when you're planning. When it comes to technological progress, and I know you talk about this in the book, can you give listeners a sense of just how much progress we've experienced? Because sometimes it's it's hard for us to feel it because you know the the day to day we don't experience the changes. But if you look back throughout history of how just how fast things have evolved, can you give us a sense of just how quickly technology is evolving? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think it's uh, particularly useful to think about this uh, with the last two hundred years. Um, so basically, uh, since eighteen twenty. Uh, so think back to uh, uh, the time of the industrial revolution. Uh, so. At that time, uh, it was uh, nine in 10 people uh, lived on the equivalent of less than $2 a day. Um, so only, you know, another way to think about that, only one in 10 people uh, had more than what we count as extreme poverty uh, today. Uh, and that rate uh, has, has gone down, that proportion, uh, until now, uh, it's less than it's, it's the other way around. You know, less than one in ten people is below that extreme poverty level now. And of course, they're still living on far too little, but back then, almost everyone lived on far too little. Uh, 
Another another thing is uh, literacy uh, in 1820 was about 10% of people were literate in the world. Uh, and now it's more than 80% of people are literate. Uh, more than 40% of, of uh, children uh, died uh, in the first year of life uh, in 1820. Uh, and now it's less than 5%. And life expectancy, so how long people lived on average, uh, has more than doubled uh, over that time. So we're living lives that are twice as long. So I think that this is a huge amount of change, uh, particularly in this period since the Industrial Revolution, uh, in terms of the quality of our lives. Yeah, it's very, very exciting to see uh, some of these positive numbers that we're seeing. And I suppose just in terms of technology, you know, when I had somebody, for example, like Pamela McCardock on, on the podcast, or whether it's a technology executive at a company, they're always trying to quantify just just how much technological progress we've had in terms of, you know, what, what we use to launch uh, spacecrafts several decades ago to the power that we have in an iPhone that we carry around in our pockets now to where this is going to be in 10 years, 50 years, 100 years. So if you were to maybe look at uh, specifically the, the AI technology piece, mm -hmm. what are you seeing there as far as progress goes? Are we making, because obviously AI is not a new concept. It's been around for many, many decades, uh, you know, since I think the, the 60s, the 50s. Mm -hmm. 50s, and yeah. The 50s. And we haven't achieved true AI yet, but it seems like now a lot of people are saying we're going to get there. So has, has something changed over the last few decades that's bringing us closer to that? Yeah, I would say that probably, um, let me see. So back in the early days, uh, we thought uh, somewhat intuitively uh, that there were certain tasks like playing chess uh, that with a pinnacle of human intelligence. Um, there are other ones as well, like advanced mathematics or uh, logical reasoning. And we thought that, that these types of things um, were going to be the hardest things. And AI scientists uh, worked on them and actually had a lot of success, uh, even, even quite early on. Um, it's, it, you know, it took until uh, the, the Battle of uh, Deep Blue and uh, Kasparov in the, in the 90s uh, to, to really become the best in, you know, to, for AI to, to beat the best humans at chess. Uh, but it didn't take that long before they could beat uh, me at chess. Uh, but what was surprising uh, and, and was that there were a whole lot of other tasks uh, that we, we treat as actually really easy tasks. Uh, the type of thing that a two-year-old could do, uh, such as picking up an egg or identifying a cat, uh, that, that we think of as really easy. Uh, but it turns out that the AI systems that we we're developing couldn't do those tasks. So the early researchers were very optimistic because they thought that they were making great progress on the hard tasks. But what was surprising was really that the the ones that we think of as easy are hard for AI and vice versa. Um, so that was a that was a big thing to to eventually uh, to learn and and take into account. Uh, but now we're finding that uh, some of those things that were that you know, that a two-year-old could do, that our AI systems couldn't do, we're actually working out some good ways to deal with them. So one of the big problems was that these early systems were quite symbolic. Um, you told them, uh, you programmed in stuff about a chessboard and uh, what, it, you know, in terms of the symbols, you know, that they have a king here and that it can move here and say so eight by eight grid and so on. That was all directly programmed in. It wasn't that it was looking at a chessboard. And they were very good at manipulating symbols but they weren't good at this, what we call the symbol grounding problem of working out what those symbols stand for. So they could do things with the word cat, but they didn't understand, uh, you know, what kind of thing in the world, this kind of fuzzy uh, ball of things <laughs> with four legs running around that actually is a cat. Uh, and uh, the real breakthrough recently has been with deep learning. Uh, so a, uh, a way of using neural networks uh, with the huge amounts of data and uh, computation that we have available has really helped us do this simple grounding problem uh, and actually have systems that can take raw pixels of input uh, and actually make progress with that. So uh, one, of the, uh, one of the best examples, I think, uh, was uh, what uh, DeepMind did. Uh, before the, the famous uh, games of Go uh, and chess that they played, beating, beating the, the world's best players, uh, they had this uh, Atari playing system uh, that would play these old Atari games, uh, and it could learn to play them just from the raw pixels. 
And that's something completely different to what any of the earlier AI systems could do. Uh, so if you put you know, one of these Atari games in front of it and just tell it the score and let it see what's happening on the screen, uh, then after a month of playing it, uh, it could achieve human level performance on about half of these different games that was shown. Uh, and so this was like a, a real breakthrough uh, in in doing something that, you know, we think Atari is easier than Go, but it's because of this uh, this kind of paradox where the, the hard things are easy and the easy things are hard, that this was a real game changer. What is AI? How would you explain it? Because a lot of companies say it. Uh, well, I mean, every company says it. A lot of companies say mm-hmm. they offer it. Um, but it seems like a lot of people have different definitions of what AI is. So how... How do we know what AI is? How would you explain or define it? Yeah, so one of the definitions that I like best, uh, although it's a bit narrow, uh, is that uh, intelligence is the ability to achieve your goal in a wide variety of circumstances. Uh, so you therefore have to be able to adapt to your circumstances uh, in order to uh, to deal with different kinds of circumstances, to find your way around obstacles and so forth. Um, so it's a nice kind of short definition. But it's, it is very focused on an agent. It's something that has goals that's kind of trying to achieve them. Uh, but we might think that, that systems that uh, – t- take this uh, GPT-2 system uh, that OpenAI developed last year uh, that has read a huge corpus of text, uh, a very large amount of text from the internet. And then if you start it off with a kind of plausible sounding couple of first sentences, it can write the rest of a few pages for you and sound at least like a plausible person on the internet. Uh, And that system isn't trying to achieve any kind of goal. Um, That's not really how it works. Uh, It's not a goal-directed system. But it still seems to be exhibiting at least uh, some kind of intelligence or doing some kind of cognitive work, we could say. Uh, So maybe you want a broader definition that can include things like that as well. Uh, And at the kind of most broad uh, there's this question about whether things that are getting uh, badged as AI at the moment are really just uh, doing st- statistical methods uh, that wouldn't have been called AI uh, 10 years ago. Yeah, that's that's the big challenge today because a lot of people are saying everything is AI and it's really just uh, you know computing or an algorithm doing something. Uh, so I think that's a, actually a very interesting distinction is something that has goals. So what mm-hmm. what could be an example of a goal that AI might have? And please don't say wipe out the human race. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, um, uh, I mean, these game playing things are, are very simple examples. Uh, the the aim of uh, AlphaGo was to win a game of a game of Go. Um, and uh, it, 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 this is a. Uh, it's kind of interesting and somewhat instructive to think about exactly what that goal was, uh, because it was given. Uh, it, it it could kind of cheat. It, it wasn't looking at a board of Go either. It was uh, it was told exactly kind of how a board is uh, is constructed in in terms of the mathematics, um, and so, uh, I, you know, it, it wouldn't notice, for example, that maybe you could win the game of Go by getting the other player drunk or something like that. That's totally out of out of how it's considering the game. It's not kind of noticing that there are physical objects that are kind of playing the game with or anything like that. Um, it's just trying to work out what would it do to beat it, another copy of itself. Um, so uh, so while it has a goal, uh, it's not quite what we think the goal is. It's not really a goal about the real world. It's a goal about its kind of abstracted version of of the game of Go. And I actually followed, uh, followed that. So I, I mean, I, I love chess and anybody who's ever... Uh, listened to any of my podcasts or watch any videos n- knows that I'm pretty obsessed with this. So I love that you brought mm-hmm. this up. But I remember in um, in the game, uh, what year was it? Was it 2017 when this took place against Lee Sedol, the the Go champion? Mm-hmm. Um, and I believe it was was it game game five or game game, se- game four? I think where, where there was like that that move that the computer yeah. played, and everybody was like, "Oh my god, this is the sign of creativity in AI," and everybody like lost you know i'm not going to curse on the podcast but everybody lost their marbles and and it yeah, was all, right. all over the place people were giving talks about it it was in papers like ai has achieved creativity like everybody run for the hills it that that seems to have died down a lot nobody's really talking about that anymore um so maybe first can you explain what the significance of that was for people who are not familiar with it and i'm, I'm yeah. just curious to hear your take on it Sure. Uh, so, so I'm I'm no uh, Go expert, but I, but I have I have asked about this question uh, by people who are, and uh, uh, the what's going on there is that in the game of Go, you know, you take turns placing, you know, one player plays white stones and one play, player plays black, and you choose an empty 
location on the board and you can place a stone there. Uh, and in certain cases, you capture other people's stones or you claim territory and the person who claims the most territory at the end wins. Uh, and one of the ways to claim territory is to cordon off areas around the corners or the edges of the board. Uh, and uh, there's a there's a concept of, you know, how close are you to the edge of the board and how how far away from the edge of the board can you play and be confident of being able to claim the territory uh, from where you are to, towards the edge. And what uh, what AlphaGo did with that move is it played one level further away from the edge of the board than people thought you could get away with. Uh, so if you if you can succeed in doing that, your stones can claim more territory and also have more influence over the center of the board. So it's much more powerful for you uh, if you can play in that kind of daring way. And effectively, people, it seems like humans have been playing it too safe because they uh, they didn't realize that if, if they were playing, maybe if they were playing better, they'd be able to prevent any any attacks that tried to stop them claiming that territory. Uh, and so this, this was something that uh, it was, we, we certainly would have thought it was creative if a human had done it. Um, which is not quite the same as saying it's it's necessarily creative. Uh, and ultimately, if you have a game like Go or a game like chess, at some level, the game is uh, is kind of closed. So there there is, you could imagine a, a kind of a branching tree diagram uh, for the game of Go or the game of chess, where the first move of chess, you know, you, players have, uh, what is it, uh, uh, 20 moves, I think, uh, that they could make. And then, you know, the opponent has has 20 moves they could make. And then, you know, the, the number changes uh, as you play. But ultimately, it can only go on for finitely many moves. And so there's only finitely many different games of chess that you could play. So in theory, if you had, a, if you had enough computation abil ability, even just with a brute force algorithm, it could find the best possible games of chess uh, that anyone could play. The types of games that if we saw, we'd say were dazzlingly creative solutions to these problems. Uh, even if it was just a, a boring brute force system with enough compute. Um, so that's a bit funny as to like as to whether you should really call those things creative or not. Um, but since the AlphaGo system did not have a uh, you know astronomical amount of computation, the kind of thing that's you know more than the whole universe worth of computers uh, that would be needed in the example I gave. Uh, so it, it did it it did it with you know less compute, computational ability than the human brain. So, you know, maybe we should call it creative. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's what a lot of people have been saying. And, and oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Have, have you seen uh, some of these, uh, these chess games uh, that, that Alpha Zero has played? Oh, yeah, the recent ones, actually. Um, some at the end of, well, last year, and I think there might have even been some this year. Yeah, Alpha Zero playing against uh, itself. Actually, no, it was, it was Alpha Zero playing against... Um, they created Stockfish. Stockfish, but there was like two versions of Alpha Zero I thought they made. Oh. Um, one that had the um, the rules and sort of some things embedded in it, and it was looking at games from the past, uh -huh. and another version where it had to learn everything on its own. And the, the version where it learned on its own beat the other version that looked at human games and information 100 to huh. 0. Oh wow! Okay, I, I should I should find that and watch it. Um, I mean the the games I've seen, uh, which were from the earlier lot against Stockfish, were still amazing. Uh, but they're so far above my level uh, that I had to to watch them with expert commentary. Uh, but it was uh, yeah, it was it was it was dazzling. Yeah, it was not, so. Okay, now I have to ask: Are you a chess player, Toby? Uh, <laughs> not not really. Uh, but you get the rules of the game. You you play. A uh, I bit. get the rules of the game exactly. All right, all right. <laughs> Um, so looking then bigger picture, uh, when we look at the future of humanity with technology and AI, there's, of course, a lot of conversations around something like a Skynet coming or something like from the film The Matrix where, you know, technology just takes over and we're slaves to it. Is that going to happen? Be honest with us, Toby. Uh, I, I hope not. Um, so uh, I'll, so. Yeah, should we should we break down? You know, what are the types of concerns here? Yes, yes, please. So, the way I see it is that uh, AI systems are getting increasingly more sophisticated. Um, they're getting, uh, you know, more able to solve kind of a, a wider a range of tasks, um, and to do so better than than humans. Uh, so they're becoming more general, and then also better at each of the tasks that they can do. Uh, so. 
one definition of something called artificial general intelligence is an AI system uh, that could accomplish every task better and more cheaply than human workers. And uh, recently, a few years back, uh, 300 top researchers in machine learning were surveyed on this question of when could an AI system do that? Um, this obviously has big implications for uh, for the future of work as well, right? If the system can accomplish every task better or more cheaply than human workers, uh, then it's it's not clear what we're doing. And uh, quite quite amazingly, um, on average, uh, they estimated a fifty percent chance of this happening by the year twenty sixty one, and even a ten percent chance of it happening as soon as twenty twenty five, which is uh, five years from now. It was nine years from the time when the survey was asked. So maybe they they would wouldn't still say that, but they're they're saying that it's it's not impossible for this to happen, you know, in a decade, very very soon. And I guess they'd be somewhat surprised if it didn't happen by the end of the century, but not all that surprised. Well, Ray Kurzweil uh, didn't he also? What was his year? Did he say twenty forty or twenty thirty? Were uh, so. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly. I can't remember the Kurzweil year, but there's something weird about this question. If someone says, "When will something happen?" And you, you give some year as an answer. You say, oh, it'll happen in 2040. Um, like how, you know, it's, it's weird that you're so confident that it'll happen at this one particular time. I, I think the better way to do it is this kind of question where you say, you imagine like a curve that you're drawing on a piece of paper and you imagine every year over the next century. And then you say, what chance is there that it will happen before that time? And then you kind of draw this curve. Um, and I think that that's a better way of doing this. And so this kind of question of where does that curve reach 50%? I think is a good way of kind of, if you just had to pick one number, one date. Uh, and so these experts said that it hits 50%. So just as much chance of it happening as not happening in 2061. Now, if 2061 comes and it hasn't happened, that doesn't mean these people are wrong because they actually said there's as much chance that it wouldn't happen as that it would happen. Uh, but it, it's, uh, it's, I think it's a, a better way of asking the question that doesn't somehow involve you saying there's a 90% chance it happens on this one year or something, and, and no one could ever know, yeah. know with that level. Yeah. But, but if, you take, if you take these people at their word, you know, they're, they're basically saying something like a 50% chance that AI systems will be able to do all of this, uh, you know, everything a human can do, uh, at least in terms of intellectual tasks uh, this century. And if we did that, as well as there being kind of massive implications for work, there's massive implications for our species. Uh, so Homo sapiens, uh, if we look at this 200,000 year history and we ask, you know, how did we get to where we are? Uh, why is it that it's humans that are in control of their destiny? Uh, humans that, in, in a way that uh, say chimpanzees uh, or blackbirds are not in control of their destiny. Um, you know, if humans do something that, that happened, uh, to wipe out these species, there's not much they could do about it. Um, you know, hopefully we won't, uh, but it, it's in our hands, not in their hands, uh, unfortunately for them. But what is it that, that put us in the position of power over the planet? And ultimately, it's, it all comes down to our, uh, our mental abilities. Um, so intelligence may be things that we don't normally call intelligence, but are still mental, such as our ability to communicate uh, with each other through language. Uh, but it's definitely the mental, not the physical abilities of humans that are the reason where we've got this position, uh, this commanding position where we control our own destiny and could have an Im immense potential for the future. And so if we do create AI systems, these general AI systems that can, uh, uh, that can do everything we can uh, better and more cheaply than we can, why would it be us who are in control of our future from that point onwards? Uh, it, it's it's uh, a... That's, there could be an answer to that question. Uh, perhaps the reason that we're still in control is because we carefully kind of encode rules into these systems to make sure we're still in control. Uh, maybe we manage to make them uh, do what we want, uh, or we manage to make them do what they want, but we cunningly make it so that what they want, you know, when they build their ideal world, they're also building our ideal world. So there could be some answers to that question about why is it that uh, things won't go very wrong at that point. Um, but it turns out that those tasks of, uh, of either making the AI systems uh, listen to us and do what we want or to make them uh, aligned with us in terms of their values, having the same values as us, are both extremely hard. And the people in AI looking at those problems uh, 
are really uh, searching around for solutions. They've got a few ideas, but but they're saying that this looks extremely hard and we might not be able to get that done in time before we have systems which have that level of power. I know that you also spend a lot of time, you know, you've, you've advised governments and, and leaders at various organizations uh, and governments around the world. Mm-hmm. What, what did they ask you about the most? What are they most either worried about or concerned with or wanting your advice and guidance on the most? So, uh, so some of this was on my, my earlier work about global poverty. So trying to understand how we can most effectively help people in poor countries. Uh, and uh, some of it has been, yeah, on future trends and technologies and ideas. Uh, for example, about uh, uh, interest in AI and work. Um, I, I would like them to always be asking me these, these other questions about uh, existential risks, uh, the, these risks to the entire future of humanity and what they could be doing to protect us. They don't tend to ask me about that. Hopefully after this book comes out, they will. Uh, but my experience when talking to them about those uh, existential questions is that they say, wow, that's really interesting, uh, but it's above my pay grade. Uh, and everyone seems to react like this, um, at least up, you know, all the way through the national level of government, that it's something where it just feels a bit too big for them to deal with. And they're used to thinking about the, the news cycle, you know, the next, the next week or so, or, or about the election cycle. Uh, but something that's that you're talking about, what do we need to put in place uh, such that we can be protected from engineered pandemics, you know, in, in 20 or 30 years time? How do we need to start working now in order to avoid that? It's so far beyond their normal horizons. And it's at such a level thinking about not just a country and not even just global level, but the entire future of humanity, that they're not really used to thinking about those questions at all. Um, and I, I'm hoping th- to make them uh, better at thinking about these things. Are these questions we should all be thinking of or just people in positions of power? Yeah, I think they're, they're questions that we should all be thinking of. Um, I, I think that they're they're outside of what we normally think of as the domain of morality. Um, uh, you know, if you ask someone to, to say a few things about, you know, what what does it mean to be moral or, or you tell me about ethics, it's unlikely that they'll be talking about this this kind of stuff uh, within the, within the you know the first uh, thousand words that they say. Uh, but it is something where um, it's clearly linked to questions of good and bad and right and wrong. Um, if someone uh, takes some kind of risk that threatens uh, the lives of everyone else on the planet when they're building their new technology, uh, and threatens not just that, but threatens to break kind of to sever. Uh, this thread of humanity that's lasted for 200,000 years and could last for hundreds of thousands of years more. It does seem like they're, they're doing something uh, seriously wrong if they're taking these risks uh, recklessly without, without you know, appropriate reason. Um, so it is part of the domain of morality, but it's not something that we normally think of. But I think that that could change, uh, just like it did for environmentalism, where thinking about the environment wasn't really considered part of leading a moral life. Uh, up until about 1960, and then from 60 to 70, it, it radically changed uh, to the point where, when I was growing up in the 80s, uh, most of our moral education at school was about uh, not littering and looking after the environment and so forth, almost as much of it as there was about you know being nice to other people. So uh, similarly, animal welfare is something that wasn't really part of, you know, wasn't on anyone's radar um, 100 years back, but then that really changed. And I think that uh, these things partly changed because the world changed. Uh, humans got powerful enough to really affect the environment, and we started to notice some of the bad effects we were having. And uh, farming practices got more industrialized, such that we were having much worse effects on animals. And so our kind of public morality changed. It adapted to that. Um, and it adapted actually pretty quickly, uh, within decades, uh, let's say. And I think that something like that could happen here too. Uh, so the way I see it is that there have been risks that have faced humanity over hundreds of thousands of years, these natural risks, but it was only with uh, nuclear weapons uh, in the 20th century that we reached a point where humanity's escalating power over the natural world was so great uh, that it could threaten our entire continued existence. And yet our wisdom and ability to actually behave responsibly had grown only falteringly, if at all. And so it put us into this precarious position 
uh, where we still are, uh, which I call the precipice, hence the name of the book. And this is a time where we are we you know suffer these these existential risks, uh, and I think that this time can only go on for a few centuries, either because. Uh, we just if the risks stay at the current levels or increase, continue to increase, then I think we couldn't survive more than a few more centuries of this. Uh, but I also think it's possible that we'll survive it because we'll actually get our act together and we'll lower these risks and get them down to more sensible levels. That we you know we'll, we'll grow up about this this issue. Uh, and I think that there's some kind of hope for that because if we look back to the Cold War when people were thinking about nuclear weapons, there was a lot of interest in this. Uh, the the biggest ever protest in America's history uh, in Central Park was against nuclear weapons on the grounds that they posed a threat to humanity's continued existence. With the end of the Cold War, a lot of the momentum disappeared behind those, those ideas, but it's come back with climate change. And there's a lot of momentum and, again, huge protests and, and public action on this and uh, public recognition. And what I'm saying is that nuclear war and climate change are both things of this wider category. Uh, of existential risks. And that's kind of the the real set of things. And we could continue on just waiting till one of them's got really bad before we kind of, it rises to our attention. But it would be even better if we can see them in advance uh, and we can say, are there any other things that could be like this this century? What about if uh, if biotechnology continues to get really advanced? Could that threaten us? And if so, is it possible to just head it off at the pass and develop defensive technologies more quickly than the offensive technologies such that we don't you know, end up fighting fires the whole time? So I think that this idea of existential risk, uh, I think it could take off. And uh, as it has in the, in the past of people really kind of seeing the ethical issues about the continued survival of humanity. Do you think there's an overall trend in the world of focusing on these big picture, uh, big picture issues more frequently. So for example, you know, a lot of organizations are uh, standing up for something like climate change. A lot of them are focusing on things like purpose and meaning and impact, you know, like these bigger picture issues, whereas it seems like several decades ago, you know, maybe some of this was out there, but not to the extent that it is now, especially with social media and all this stuff spreading all over the place. Do you think that we're just generally thinking more about these big picture issue ideas more? Yeah, I think that uh, generally we are. There, there are a few cases where the trends go the other way and, and you could say that we're you know, spending a lot of time fixating on very small things. Um, you know, Our attention being fragmented and things like that, not giving us enough time to, to think about some of these, these deeper things. But one way that I look at it in terms of, is in terms of this um, perspective of humanity. Um, and you can think of this kind of increasing set of of uh, moral perspectives where uh, we've always had uh, this idea of the individual perspective. What should I do uh, when you're thinking about right and wrong? Uh, and occasionally we'll ask these these slightly bigger questions about what should my group or community do? You know, what should we be doing? What, what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? What could we be doing better? Uh, and then... If you think of, uh, say, the uh, the 19th century, there was a lot of move to uh, thinking about what what should your nation be doing. Uh, and then in the 20th century, uh, the, there was extra interest in taking that to the next level and thinking globally. Um, what should everyone in the planet be doing about climate change or about the ozone layer and uh, and so forth? And so I think that the, the next step in this kind of pattern is uh, that we should be thinking occasionally about what should humanity be doing, uh, where we think not just all people at the moment over the whole globe, global issues, but we think about these issues over all time. Uh, and I think that that can be quite different. Uh, so if you think of uh, humanity, uh, it, we've, we've been around for about 200,000 years. And if we live as long as a typical species, we'd have about 800,000 years more. So they typically last about a million years. And if we think of that in terms of a single life, uh, then humanity would just now be in its adolescence. And yet we find that we're, we're kind of willing to risk it all for these very small times, you know, for the equivalent of just improving one hour in its life. Uh, it risks its whole future. Uh, so I, th I find that this analogy is quite useful and, and that when you really are thinking on these kind of time spans, it helps to kind of put it into a everyday frame 
where you realize that it is like a in, insane teenager who is uh, who is taking completely unreasonable risks uh, for uh, for short term uh, reward. For most people listening to this who might be thinking, you know what, this is interesting stuff, but it's too big picture for me. I don't, I don't know what to do. Uh, this is just really overwhelming. How, what can we as individuals do to, I don't know, to, to, to think about this stuff better, to educate ourselves about these things? Mm -hmm. I mean, how does this impact us just on the, on the ground level, you know, if we're not in positions of power? Uh, you know, I'm just worried about getting a paycheck, waking up at the right time, taking my kids to school. This is like so high level. Um, what do you say to that? So I think one of the key things uh, is having a public discussion about this. Uh, so, you know, asking these questions, uh, is, it, is it true that, that humanity's entire future is at risk? Or, you know, how high is that risk? And what, you know, what are the largest risks? And what's anyone doing about it? And what should we be doing about it? And lots of questions like these that we should be asking them, uh, you know, in our families and uh, and with our friends and colleagues, uh, the kind of thing that you can talk seriously about, uh, you know, down at the pub, and uh, opening up these these wider conversations about it. Uh, so it's something where I think that that this is one of the reasons that I wrote the book was to try to show people, open up their eyes to all of these these issues that are facing us uh, that potentially threaten our entire future. And also to see how how bright our future could be if we could make it through this time. It was kind of my being so inspired by by what humanity could do and its its potential uh, that that made me, you know, fight more fiercely to try to protect that potential. And so uh, I wrote this to try to let everyone really see that. Uh, previously, discussions about this have been a bit dry and academic, and uh, and harder for for people to actually understand all of these issues. So I wanted people to be able to see it and to start these conversations, uh, both personal level and then also as kind of like larger conversations in society. Uh, so, and then another thing that they can do uh, is uh, potentially to donate to organizations who are actually working on these things. Uh, I list a few in the book. Uh, and, you know, for example, groups working to, uh, uh, to fight uh, nuclear war uh, by uh, avoiding proliferation uh, and promoting disarmament. Well, um, I was know, actually so, going to ask yeah. you about yours because you have one called Gi mm -hmm. the Giving What We Can Society. Um, so can you share a little bit about that and what you have been doing? Because I think it's actually a very interesting and noble cause that you've started. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, so I started it in uh, 2009, uh, so about, about 10 years ago. Uh, and it's a society. It, it's not it, itself like a, a charity that one would donate to. It's instead more a society of people who are who have made giving a huge part of their lives. Uh, so there are 4,000 members who have each made a pledge to give at least a tenth of what they earn over the rest of their life to uh, charities that can do the most to help others. Uh, so it's focused on on giving quite a lot, like uh, you know a tenth of, of one's earnings, and also on giving it effectively. Uh, because we've found that, that some places you can give uh, can be shown to have, you know, 10 or 100 times as much impact as others. And we give some recommendations on that. Uh, and that if you, if you are thinking about this and you make a choice to give 10 times as much as you were previously going to give, say 10% instead of 1%, and to give it somewhere 10 times as effective, you could have 100 times the social impact over your life with your giving that you, that you thought you might be able to have. And you could, with that, you could save many people's lives. Uh, it's certainly uh, possible to save, say, 100 people's lives uh, in your life. And all while living on 90% of what you would have earned anyway, and uh, having a, a really still good life yourself, you don't have to radically change your career, you could do all of this. So that was the idea. And I made this, uh, this pledge, and uh, I founded this society. Uh, yeah, we have 4,000 members. Uh, together, we've pledged more than a billion dollars uh, over our careers uh, to help others as much as possible. And uh, so far, the members have given more than $100 million and uh, have already given enough to transform the lives of tens of thousands of people. Uh, wow. So Over $100 million yeah. Dollars so far. Yeah, that's right. Jeez, that's amazing. Congratulations. Oh, thanks. Uh, well, I think we pretty much uh, covered... Uh, everything that I wanted to look at. Um, is there anything else that you want people to know or to think about before we wrap up? Uh, and then I'll ask you where people can find your book and connect with you and all that sort of stuff. But any any parting words of wisdom for the listeners? 
Yeah, here's here's one. <laughs> um, may, maybe words of foolishness rather than wisdom, but uh, you might hope uh, that these risks uh, would be being dealt with at the highest level. Uh, but it's actually, it's pretty shocking how neglected that they've been. Uh, so as two examples, um, the Bioweapons Convention, the BWC, uh, which is meant to be the kind of the equal of the Chemical Weapons Convention and the Anti-Nuclear Convention, uh, that the total funding of it is uh, less than that of a typical McDonald's restaurant. Oh my God. <laughs> and, and that existential risk on the whole, uh, for all of these risks put together, uh, that humanity is currently spending less on safeguarding its future uh, than it does on ice cream. So this is not issues that are, you know, that you think well, it's above above my pay grade, and I'm sure there's people handling it. These are issues where everyone's kind of passing the buck further up, and uh, and we're not handling it very well. Uh, so I think we really, uh, you know, we have the potential to have a really great future. Uh, it's it's not a pessimistic book, and I think that. Uh, we want to, with clear eyes, see the types of risks, see how high they are, uh, and then act appropriately and defend our future so that we can have a great future going forwards. I love that message of optimism and positivity. Um, well, where can people go to learn more about the book and connect with you? Anything that you want to mention for people to check out, please feel free to do so. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, people uh, can uh, find the book on uh, on lots of different bookstores, Amazon, you know, other places. Uh, and then when the book comes out, uh, you can uh, find out a whole lot more at theprecipice.com. Perfect. Well, Toby, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to speak with me and, and share some of these really interesting insights and, and concepts. It's refreshing sometimes to think so big picture instead of focusing on kind of the day to day that so many of us are, are used to. So thank you. Oh, thank you. And thanks everyone for tuning in. My guest again has been Toby Ward. Make sure to check out a copy of his book. And again, it's called The Precipice, Existential Risk and the Future of Humanity. And I will see all of you next week. Thanks again for tuning into the future of work with Jacob Morgan. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you want to grab a copy of my book, The Future Leader, and get leadership advice and insights directly from 140 of the world's top CEOs, then check out getfutureleaderbook.com. Please don't forget to rate the podcast on Apple Podcasts. And my contact info again is jacob at thefutureorganization.com.